Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm an astrophysicist and I serve on the board of HEAF, the Harlem Educational Activities Fund. And today I have with me this year's honoree, Verdon Perry. And, and you are head of global strategic... Global head of Blackstone Strategic Partners. Strategic Partners at Blackstone. But we're actually in New York City at the New York offices of Vista Equity Partners. And if we're there, that means we are with its founder, chairman, and CEO, Robert F. Smith. Robert, good to see you again. Good to see you, Neil. And I'm here to just to chew the fat with you guys, just to find out. Uh, first, uh, Vern, what does Blackstone do? And what do you do as part of uh, strategic uh, decisions that you make for them? Well, Blackstone is one of the largest alternative investments firms in the world. And I run one of the business units called Strategic Partners. And what we do, we buy limited partnership interests and other firms, other private equity firms, including this man's great firm, Vista Equity Partners. And so with that- Wait, you're invest, you invest in him? I do, both on a primary basis and a secondary basis. And what that means is when he raises funds, we invest because we think they're great. They have a great track record, people are great, processes are great. But, but just as importantly, we buy and invest on a secondary basis. And what that means is, if someone made an investment on a primary basis, and for whatever reason, they need to sell, we will buy them out, just so we can get more exposure to Robert F. Smith. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Because, you know, I've walked among your offices here, so what are people doing in these cubicles? I, I, I hope, <laughs> uh, I hope what they're doing okay. is uh, in the factory of creating value and mm -hmm. creating value for our stakeholders. We, as you know, have a multitude of stakeholders, one of which are, you know, Vern, his group, who are the investors in our companies, the investors in our funds, which ultimately invest in our companies. Other stakeholders of ours are our employees. And what we have to think about is developing and creating an environment for them to be productive, and I always say to be their best selves. What does that mean? Bring their creative genius to bringing value in financial services. In our case, it's enterprise software. Other stakeholders that we focus on are actually groups like Keefe. If you think about it, what we do is we look to create a platform for young, talented people to find their first experiences in portfolio companies, which are enterprise software companies, and for mature people to have a place to actually deploy their trade and developing enterprise software, which actually, frankly, changes the way that we all interact and creates massive amounts of value in our, in our world. I couldn't agree more with him, but think about it. We're in the business of recognizing value where others don't see value. And, and when you think about the driving of value, it's not just businesses or investments, it's people. So think about, you know, Robert and myself, we've both hired people that may not have gotten a 4.0 or a 3.9 or a 3.8, maybe they had a 3.4. And a lot of people may say, well, they're a diamond in the rough, or I'm just gonna ignore that, they don't have a 3.9. But you know what, they have great interpersonal skills. The ability to connect and find common ground. They're a good person. They treat others the way they wanna be treated. So if you give those people an opportunity, what I would argue, they have a lot more of what others may not have, and that's resilience. And so they, they, they haven't had an easy road, particularly if you go back into their early years and explore, how did you get here? Why do you have a 3-4 instead of a 3-9? I think some of the stories you It's because their road did this exactly. instead of making a straight line. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, here's an example. I went to school and I worked full time to you, pay for you school. You grew up where? I grew up in inner city Philadelphia, the Overbrook section of West Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And that's an example. I mean, when I speak about finding value where others simply don't recognize it, I'm an example of that. Mm -hmm. And so growing up in an environment, and by the way, both parents in the household, they were tremendous. But as we all do, you have to leave the house. And what happens outside of those doors of your home makes a big difference in who you become. Many of the challenges that I face along my journey here are now my greatest assets. Not everyone had the same opportunities starting out, but that doesn't mean they don't have the same capability or enhanced capability to optimize or maximize what the world is. Our job is to provide access to these opportunities for those who want it and who those who are willing to put in the work, the effort, and, and the diligence in the preparation. The grit. To be successful. The yeah. grit. Part of what, what, what we have to do is ensure that all people have access to these opportunities. Computing power has changed everything. And the distribution of that computing power has created more opportunity for more people now than ever in the history of, 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 of mankind.
He and I, you know, with, with Blackstone Investors, we just partnered on a deal. We're about to close it. You know, I look at the prospects of that company. It's in the education space. It is a phenomenal business that I know we're going to create massive value for our shareholders. And, oh, by the way, my expectations will probably be 40, 50 percent bigger in terms of employment when we're done with that company because of the, of the market opportunity. But you do that through leveraging intellect, capability, and technology to deliver a broader set of, in this case, educational services to more people. It makes complete sense of your immediate interest in the mission statement of HEAF, now that I hear what it is you're saying, because that is entirely resonant with everything uh, we're trying to do as a board, as an organization. So I'm delighted delighted to learn that. What I'm reminded of is this, is a, is a a story, it's apocryphal, but it's, it's something we can all think about and relate to. There's the immigrant who comes to the United States with $10 in their pocket, right? And they, and they work hard and they struggle and try to get food and then they, they, they work at a bakery and they, are, but then they get fired and they work again, but they learn some skills. Yeah. Then they maybe open their own bakery and they start selling and then it becomes a huge operation. Decades later, the person is wealthy, okay? But they had struggled every day of their lives. And the people who struggled, they know what it is to be at the bottom yeah. and to, to, to get clever mm -hmm. about how to ascend from that low place. You're, you're talking about cumulative learning, and I would call it cumulative wisdom. It's not just intelligence and knowledge, it's how do you apply it in a meaningful way. It's wisdom. And so for people who struggle and extract value and insights from failure, long term they can succeed. I tell people, your ultimate success does not depend on what you do on your best day, but rather what you do on your worst day. What happens when you fail? You lose a loved one. You, you've been disappointed, passed over per, for promotion. Do you get up, dust yourself off, and keep fighting? Or do you fold? That, that really is the question. Do you fight or do you fold? And I would argue that if you fight in those challenges where you, you might be embarrassed today. I'm sure someone, I, I was speaking to a student a year ago, and a student was embarrassed because his father was illiterate, could not read. And I said, do you know how many jobs your dad has? And Because I don't know, I didn't know his dad. He said he has two. And I said, your dad who cannot read is the reason you can read. Be proud of your dad. Be proud of the texture of your hair. Be proud of how you look. Be proud of the things you think you should be embarrassed about. Because you will come to a point in your life where you will say, thank God I experienced that. Because there will be people who life was handed to them. And the first sign of trouble, the first sign of battle, they will fold. Why? They have no scars. Mm -hmm. They've never been to battle before. Uh, almost every successful person you ever, ever meet, they, they, they got stories mm -hmm. about people who said they couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. People who said, no, give up now. But it's those experiences that taught ambition. That comes to what our role is, what your job is. You, know, you get to go and inspire millions of people a day. We get to inspire 40, and that's okay. Okay, because part of what we have to do is to create opportunities for young African-American, Latinx kids to understand, you know what, what's this thing about finance? What is, what's this guy Vern do? What's that guy Robert do? And what's, why is that so cool? And giving them opportunity through internships, through fellowships. Yeah. But part of what we have to do as people and community citizens is open that aperture of opportunity for yes. people in our community. And, and Robert is humble. Just Robert being outstanding, excellent, the best at what he does, is inspiring countless others. We may never meet them, little boys and girls, brown, black. They're hearing about Robert and they're seeing his presence. They're seeing how people respect him. And now people are starting to hear about us. It's not like we exist in a vacuum somewhere over there. People are starting to see and that inspires. Yeah, yeah it is it's an interesting a multiplying effect. Yes. And uh, while having a direct one-on-one -on -one role model, I think has value. Yes. You can't under undervalue just being visible Correct. and being the best at what you do, mm -hmm. and better than anybody else at what you do. I mean, these are these are powerful forces operating on a society that desperately needs it. Right. What do you see is in the future of technology and how it applies to the country? and how it applies, and how it might reach everyone it needs to reach. One of the most important things that we need to do as a nation today is to ensure that all 
people have access to broadband. I sit here today in a world, in a country, where about 40 million people, about 60% of them are black and brown who do not have access to broadband. And that is a travesty because we need every one of those people to participate in our economy and they cannot participate in the new age economy unless they have access to broadband and have access it's to- It's not just the economy, it's, the, it's access to knowledge. Now think about the hunger for knowledge, the hunger to succeed, the hunger to change the trajectory of their lives, give them broadband and see how often they're using it to gain knowledge. The thing was, I wasn't, I wasn't fully familiar with Heath until 2019 and Robert was nice enough to invite me to that gala oh, when we he did was a table. Honor. We did a table. the table, I was right yeah. there. And, and I heard the stories, I heard from the students, by the way, Heath should know, yeah, your, the website's phenomenal. Over 30 years of success and excellence, that's phenomenal. The students listening and seeing and hearing from the students, that is the pitch, that is it, I'm sold. And I think others would be sold as well, and I'll stop with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, you're good. But the students are better. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, always good to talk to you, man. Awesome. Okay, and and Vern, Vern, my pleasure. All, all in, all in. This conversation moved me because first, it tells us how much more work needs to be done. But I think more importantly, it tells me that we got some people who are on top of it, and I think we need more of folks just like these guys here.